Hi, I'm Roy Collin, and I'm the creator of the podcast. You can find everything about me and the five podcasts on bio.link forward slash podcaster, and you'll find it in the QR code there. I'd also like to thank my sponsors. If you or someone you know is struggling with anxiety and want to know how to be 100% anxiety free in six weeks without therapy or drugs, Daniel Packard Anxiety Solution Program Company offers a six weeks system that permanently solves anxiety at an astounding 90% success rate. People who join the program only pay at the end once they have clear, measurable results. If you're interested in learning more, go to permanentanxietysolutions.com where you can book a free consultation with Daniel. Do you have high blood pressure or want to get off the meds? Doctors are amazed at what Zona Plus can do. Get a $50 discount with my code ROY. Go to zona.com slash discount slash ROY and you see the QR code for all my sponsors down at the end. Quality Polish manufacturer of metal products for telecommunication and workshop equipment and other metals. If you'd like a brochure, you see it in the QR code and you just let us know if you would like a quotation shipped internationally and very competitive rates. I hope you enjoy this week's podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Freedom International live stream. And we are very happy that once again, you can all be with us and share this podcast to whoever you think needs to receive this message. And we are very excited and happy to have Alex Craner back. And thank you, Alex, for always coming back to us when you can. We miss you. <laughs> and true, truly, Alex, whenever there's like a uh, 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 how could, a, a, whatever exciting things happening around the world and like the top of the news or some whether it's be the in the in the mainstream or particularly in the alternative media is like well I've got to I've got to have Alex back and see what Alex thoughts are so for those of you who don't know Alex all you have to do really is type in Alex Craner. That's what I do. And I'll say June 2023, July 2023. That's what I do. It's like whatever is like the latest or even the even the pa past episodes or and not just from from our platform, but for every other else platform for OK, because he's all over the alternative media and once in a while some type of main media but it's still an alternative view and you will see alex there talking and he he travels as well and so he makes sure that you know all of us will be educated and to bring about what he thinks he needs for the audience for all of us to know. So uh, Alex is a market analyst and he used to be a, a hedge fund manager and he he's written books and especially I think two books that he's been um, it's been banned or censored more than once. So that's and you know anything that you can learn from him, some there's always that censorship so it's up to us to really keep searching and follow the people follow those thoughts not blindly but to start thinking okay so for and that's alex substack is alex craner that substack.com and he also has a blog the na naked hedgy.com okay and alex is there anything more you want to share before all the other things that you share like you know why don't you just tell people what you've been doing lately well uh, first of all grace uh thank you very much for that very kind introduction and it's always a pleasure to join you uh on your podcast and uh i, I wanted to extend warm greetings from monaco to your viewers and listeners uh what i've been doing lately well i've been extremely busy um, but one of the one of you know the, the a lot of it is day job stuff. But I've been uh, I've been working on a, on a, on an article about uh, about the war in Ukraine, and uh, you know it would be it would be a you know U Ukraine war for busy people. And uh, I started working on that article six months ago, and I thought it would be. Um, something very very condensed uh but then you know I, as i 
as I as I dipped into my notes because I was you know I was paying close attention to what was going on in back in 2014 and 2013 as the as the things were uh, uh, you know the events were gaining momentum and as I started working through my notes <clears throat> uh, I. I, I ended ended up getting lost in the in the in the rabbit hole a little bit, and the article ended up. I'm on, I'm on twenty pages so far, and mind you, I'm trying to keep it, you know, as 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 condensed as possible, and I'm still not done, and I still probably have another three, four, five pages b- before I can say that I've come full circle. So that's been that's been occupying a lot of my attention, and then uh, I've also um, s- over the summer I read uh, Michael Hudson's book, The Fall of Antiquity, and I was I was absolute I, I have to mention that book because I was absolutely amazed by it. You know, um, at some point last year, uh, maybe October, November, I'm I'm a Catholic, but I'm not particularly devout. You know, I, I, I basically never go to church and it's just simply not part of my life. Uh, I tried to read the Bible on a few occasions in my life, but I didn't get very far into it. And then I don't know what possessed me last fall that I I picked up this gospel of Matthew and I, I read it. And as I read it, I thought like, well, you know, whatever I'm glimpsing in this sounds to me very, very familiar you know, in the sense that the people, the place, the events might have been, um, you know, um, people fighting for their freedom against against a very greedy, rapacious empire. And then I, tr- I thought, I, I, I really want to look into this a lot more, but there's very little information about it. That is, it's hard to find it. And particularly the part that I was very interested in is the, the economy of the Roman Empire, the economy of Judea and, and you know, the Levant, and, the, and their, their monetary system. You know, because it seemed to me that King Herod there was a little bit of a Zelensky. And uh, he was doing all these megalomaniacal construction projects all over Judea. And who was funding this? So I thought, well, maybe it was the Roman uh, Roman bankers who were funding it. And I was, I was, I was finding... You know, information about it, a little line here, a little paragraph there. And then I think it was like in April this year that I watched some podcast and it was uh, Dr. Michael Hudson and he was talking about his new book and it was the collapse of antiquity, exactly about these things. And uh, he said that he spent, uh, he started researching for this book in 1980. And uh, so I ordered the book immediately, and it was exactly, you know, the answer to my prayers, the everything that I wanted to learn about. But the 40 years that he put into it is the time that I didn't have to put into it. So I was very, you know, I feel like I was, uh, I, 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 I've been very enriched this summer. And so I thought I'd mention that because I think, Oh. Can you hear him? I uh, I lost connection for a yeah. few seconds. Can okay. you yes. see it hear me? Okay. Something went wrong. Yeah. You well, were, and, you and, were, and for the rest, you know, it's been summer activities, uh, you know, traveling with the kids, a couple of a couple of uh, conferences uh, that I participated in and now getting back to, you know, tomorrow, September again, cannot believe it. <laughs> so I think we lost uh, connection at that. You were referring again to Michael Hudson's book, the fall of antiquities or antiquity. Uh, the fall of antiquity. That fall of antiquity. So just to reiterate, 
quickly. Yeah. Long. So, uh, did you did you lose me at the towards the end or the whole thing? Towards the end. Yeah. Just towards. Yeah. The end. Just no. The end. So I, I I basically I just, you know, I I, I said that. I think that this book will prove to be very significant because it exposes history in a way that hasn't been put together quite in this way before, at least not that I'm aware of. And I, you know, I've, I've read quite a bit of history in my life and, you know, the way, the way history is presented conventionally is a, uh, pretty much one damn thing after another, you know, uh, this happened and then that happened and the, this battle and that piece. And they never tell you the, the essence of it. You know, they never tell you the, the core problems and it goes, it is still, it is still important for them to obscure that aspect of history meaning the economic and financial aspect of history to the point, which is something that Michael Hudson mentions in his book that, you know, our, our source of main source of information about Punic Wars between the Roman empire and uh, Carthage is Livy, his uh, civil wars and uh, the penguin classics uh, published a translation of Livy's book about the Punic Wars. And the Penguin thought it appropriate to omit three paragraphs from Livy's original text that deals with the problem of money and finance and indebtedness that was practically the main reason for the war. You know, it would be it would be like if today, if somebody wrote the history of today, and they said, well, you know, there was Ukraine, and there was President Zelensky, and then there was a uh, evil President Putin who wanted to expand Russia because he had territorial ambitions, and so invaded and conquered a, a chunk of Ukraine, never mentioning any any other details which which are actually essential in in the history. So. I, you know, if, if Professor Michael Hudson is watching this, I'm sure he is, uh, then I, I wanted to thank him for the effort. And I think it will prove extremely important. If Nobel Prize Committee was uh, worth anything at all, they would they would accord him a Nobel Prize for this book. Then that gives me a hint that I should try very hard to find him and have him have him as a guest and i will personally deliver your appreciation for his book and Thank but you. but what you said and what he wrote is really true many times we look at things very linearly and then we don't uh we and linearly and it's just like all just even like in music right it's just all maybe bass tones but we don't look at the overtones the resonant tones so all those other things that's happening instead of uh, making everything like uh, you know what's uh, what is really a human being how it is to be here and that's why we appreciate you we appreciate Matthew because you know you look at things in a very spherical very broad way and and that's that's why we always invite you back and thank you so much so and and so when alex when you when you, i saw that title you know you wrote we've reached the end of western colonialism that's like music to my ears and then muse and sure others now for others i don't know they may not they may think like whoa it has ended so in and then in the next article that alex wrote for those who don't who haven't subscribed yet with uh in alex uh substack so he wrote another um article and it says the business of freedom and democracy and that's when he expanded on on explaining that colonialism really never went away so alex give us or educate us more on what are the signs right now what are the palpable events that we can see we can experience that's why you wrote okay it's the end of western colonialism for good for sure although it may take a while well i think that it is over 
I do think, however, that it's not, uh, you know, it's it's going to take a while for uh, the loose ends to be taken care of. And the reason why I believe it's over is because this is not, you know, we had a coup in Niger. This This is not like one coup, one leadership uh, team who changed the government and ousted the Western French uh, puppet leaders. This is a broad-based movement. And, uh, you know, in the past we had these g changes of government where somebody came to power who genuinely wanted to emancipate their people from the colonial exploitation, like Abdel Nasser or, uh, you know, uh, Maurice, um, Patrice Lumumba, uh, uh, Gaddafi, um, President Mossadegh in Iran, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and so forth. So there have been many of these examples through history, but it was genu generally a single person or a single person plus his support, you know, in team. And so they would be such such leaders would be relatively easy to crush, to embargo, to sanction, to to turn their nation into a, you know, not quite Stone Age, but you know what I mean, uh, you know, to turn their economy into a into a shell of what it could be by by sanctions and embargo, and this is this is still being done to nations like Venezuela and Cuba and 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 others, but. This time around, I think that we have a broad-based movement. I think that we have also an awakening of awareness of where the problem is coming for, from. Um, I, I used to live in Venezuela, and you know things are difficult there. Uh, they have high inflation. The economy is practically permanently in some kind of a crisis. Uh, the government appears to be mismanaging the economy and the society and, you know, things are not looking great. However, uh, they are being under almost constant siege by the empire. They're being uh, blockaded. They're being embargoed. They're being uh, sabotaged. They're being sanctioned. Uh, their, their cargoes are being uh, basically pirated at sea. Their gold reserves have been stolen. They are being denied imports of essential medicines and so forth. So for the people on the ground, uh, it was very easy to, to take all this as signs that they're, you know, the government is incapable and corrupt and all these things. But I think, and, 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 and therefore, such governments under Western pressure would lose uh, support at home. People were not aware that the pain is coming from abroad, not necessarily from their incapable government. And I think that this is starting to change because there's a growing awareness that the pain is coming from the West, that the West is uh, sabotaging these, these nations and trying to weaken their governments. And it seems to me that the people are, uh, as, they, as they understand this, they solidify their support for their governments even uh, while situ the situation is difficult. And so, you know, in Niger, we saw people who gave something like 70 some percent support to the new coup regime. Um, we saw the neighboring countries that had their own coups in the past um, give support and pledge that they will help them defend if there's a if there's an invasion by the ECOWAS and the Nigerian army, and provide uh, you know weaponry and troops. Um, we saw relatively neutral statements from elsewhere around the world. You know, governments that didn't outright support the coup, but who uh, you know are not necessarily supportive of the of the of the you know, overturned the overthrown puppet regime either. 
And then, you know, just yesterday we found, we got the news that there was a coup in Gabon as well. So it seems that all the Francophone Africa is, is um, in the same sequence of event, uh, shaking off their colonial past. And that I believe is not a coincidence. And I think it comes from this growing political awakening by the people and the realization that they do not have to be condemned to poverty and misery in perpetuity, and also an awareness that there's a different system that is available to them now. You know, they're not they're not stuck with Western corporations and Western financial systems. They don't have to earn dollars anymore necessarily. They can now trade with Russia and China and with each other in, in local currencies or in, in yuan. And so now, for the first time in centuries, actually, all these nations have a choice. And this is a huge, huge, massive change. It's going to be a positive change for them, although it's, it's probably going to be rather bumpy and, and maybe uh, difficult for, for a little while. And it's also going to be a huge change for uh, the Western uh, colonial powers, and I think that ultimately is going to be positive change there as well, because you know we need to feel that pain. We need, we need to understand in what way exactly uh, our societies have uh, been mismanaged and misdirected, uh, and to what extent our wealth and prosperity was earned on the backs of uh, the, the, the the global south. And so I think all of these old structures have to implode and we have to find our new, our new way forward. You know, for France, for example, uh, France is a wonderful country and French people are very capable people. You know, they uh, produce, you know, very high end technologies, you know, their, their industrial and distribution system are, are second to none. Um, you know, you have uh, world-class uh, agriculture in France, very diversified, very high-quality produce. You know, France has a lot to offer to the world. And I think that the French entrepreneurs who produce things that they could exchange uh, with the world would benefit from these changes. But unfortunately, the whole system is has been hijacked and taken control of by these elites who basically exploit both the their own people domestically as well as the uh, as the people of the of the colonized nations so uh, you know it'll be a difficult adjustment for the western nations but pro probably a positive one in the long term and i think it will be wonderful for the for the for the countries that free themselves from the colonial exploitation with the, um, the Briggs and you know I see like Egypt, Ethiopia, South Africa, like you know join that and even Saudi Arabia is one recently that said like are they against the digital currency and is it also encouraging the coups that are happening because they're kind of going hey we can get away from this we can we we can start joining their gang. Oh uh, well, you know I think that when we talk about digital currency, I you know there's. There's, that covers all kinds of possibilities, and uh, you know, if 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 your question refers to the future common uh, trade currency, um, that's a future development, you know. And they're not, you know, the the BRICS nations are, I think, in the early stages of developing such a currency. Uh, it might be digital in the way. It functions, but it will probably be backed by gold and other commodities, nonetheless. You know, and then, you know, uh, maybe large imbalances will be swapped out by you know exchanges of gold or oil or whatever. Um, if we're talking about the CBDCs, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I misunderstood your question. No, 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 okay, no, because it's uh, kind of what you're saying is perfect. If yeah. we're talking about the digital currencies, as in as in CBDCs, as the Western 
you know, control matrix that they're trying to impose on all of their populations and the whole world, I think that that's never going to fly. I think there's far too much opposition and their, their window of opportunity there is so narrow, it will be practically like pushing a camel through the eye of the needle. I, I, I just don't see it happening. Uh, you know, it's, it's possible that they will impose some kind of a digital currency on us that is, you know, try to withdraw cash and oblige us to use electronic payments and money. But the, the whole programmable part, the, the, the control matrix part, that's, gonna, that's not going to work. And I, 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 the reason why I don't think it's going to work is because the project is far, far too ambitious, far too complex. They do not have the solutions uh, ready. And the likelihood of them building out something like this in a way that functions flawlessly, that is accepted by people to use. Because, you know, like our compliance, our acceptance is absolutely essential. Now, if we if we if we reject it, the, the the thing falls apart. There's there's no doubt about that. And uh, you know, if they if they impose some kind of a half baked solution that isn't going to work correctly, which is practically a certainty, then people will reject it. People will trade on gray and black markets, and uh, you know, the governments are not going to be able to tolerate that because they. They will not collect any taxes on on any of those transactions. So I think that on a very short order, the governments could find themselves uh, financially in a, in, a, in a big, big problem. And I think that there's going to be then a panicked return to cash in some form, just so that they could, you know, get people back into the into their own um, legal tender for exchange and to be to make sure that they can uh continue to charge taxes on on all the all, all the trade transactions because if they let it go they might not be able to get it back you know the these gray and black markets will probably develop very very rapidly and people will find you know goods and services way cheaper than on the official markets and probably a much much more diverse offering of goods and services and they will resist getting back into the government matrix where things will be, you know, uh, more expensive and uh, less diverse. Uh, of, like, uh, basically, uh, you know, you will have a free market competing with something like a Soviet gulag. You know, that's that's probably the choice that the people are going to have. So it's a very, very risky thing for uh, the Western government governments uh, to be introducing the CBDCs in the way that they have envisioned them, you know, the programmable control ones. So I think not only is it going to be uh, rejected by the nations of the, of the global South, it's also going to be rejected by the, by the, the, the very populations of these Western nations. Excellent. And with, so, so sorry, we, like with the way what's happening in Africa, because obviously they've been raped and pillaged. It should have been like the you know African continent should have been the richest in the world with all you know the gold, uranium, diamonds, oil, everything. And now they're kind of turning off the tap for that, but the powers that be don't want that. So kind of what repercussions can be happening? What's your thoughts on that? I, I, Roy, I, I'm, I, I missed the question part on that of, of that. So it's like basically because they're kind of taking their own sovereignty, and the people that have control over all their assets will be losing that. But they're not going like usually the people that are in control aren't going to just accept that. Like what kind of repercussions oh. will we be expecting to see? What could they be doing? Look, I think that I. I've been observing over the last few years that the, you know, the ruling establishment in the West has has degenerated quite a bit. They are, if they're smart, they're 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 hiding it very well. Uh, they are, you know, they are um, doubling down on solutions that are 
failing and they have proven themselves ineffective for for many years um i think that the the nuclear option of of you know military intervention is becoming less and less likely you know the the western powers have largely allowed their military might to uh, ossify and deteriorate uh they have to a good extent disarmed themselves in trying to fight russia in ukraine um they've also lost the confidence of their military brass in you know the political leadership has lost the confidence of the military brass so if you know if today emmanuel macron wanted to mobilize the French military to go fight in Niger, uh, I think that he would probably have a very hard time of it. And I think that the French public would not tolerate, you know, news about uh, French troops coming back in, 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 in coffins. So it's politically all becoming extremely difficult. Um, you know, the less drastic solutions like uh, color revolutions and assassinations and sabotage and so forth, they will certainly be trying this as hard as they can you know sanctions blockades uh, all of this but even there you know it's 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 always a double edged sword you know because if you're not able to wrest control of niger in a relatively quick and clean way it's causing all kinds of other problems you know uh, for example uh, there was a you know since since the Europeans shot themselves in the face over over Russian oil and gas by by sanctioning Russia, and they can't really mm, at the moment, you know, they can't they can't bring themselves to backtrack on this. Uh, so you know they had this big plan about uh, Trans-Saharan uh, natural gas pipeline uh, going from Nigeria through Niger and Algeria to the Mediterranean coast. And from there, serving you know Spain and Italy and 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 uh, and France and other nations, so this was going to be an alternative energy supply to uh, the Russian energy supplies. Well, you know, if you if you cannot control Niger or make a, an a, an acceptable deal with the with the government of Niger, then you're cut off. You cannot build that pipeline. Uh, also, you know the French themselves cannot intervene really. So they're trying the ECOWAS countries to intervene. This will have un unintended consequences as well. It, and it looks like Nigeria might be uh, coerced to intervene and uh, some of the other ECOWAS nations might be coerced to, to join and help with the effort. But if things don't go well and they don't go smoothly, it's going to cost Nigeria very daily. You know, like it could potentially precipitate um, a civil war in Nigeria or or a fall of the government there. And then what have you done? You know, you tried to wrest back Niger and instead you lost Nigeria as well. So uh, I think that the Western powers do not have any good cards to play. They have bad cards. That doesn't mean that they couldn't uh, finagle something and maybe set the process back in their favor a little bit. But, you know, I think that that would be a temporary relief. And I think that the, you know, the, this decolonization is a, is a story whose time has come. And I think it's a, because it's a, because it's a broad based movement, because the, the formerly colonized countries have an option and a choice today that you know that they would be much much better off if they were smart the, the westerners i mean to simply try to deal in good faith with respect with these nations to apologize for the abuses of the past and to say we would like to still trade with you we have things to offer you have things to offer we can have a mutually beneficial relationship. But, you know, as I said, it seems to me that the ruling establishment has deteriorated, that they are not smart, and they will try every underhanded uh, ploy that they can think of before they run out of options and then do, do the right thing. And we have seen that actually in how they dealt with the, with the Russian grain deal. You know, they... they 
they had a they had a grain deal with Russia. Russia has fulfilled their obligation. The West has fulfilled none of their obligations. And then the Russia broke the deal after more than a year of patiently abiding by it and giving them every chance to uh, uh, act in good faith. They never did. The West never did. And then instead of saying like, okay, sorry, uh, we, we messed up. We apologize. Please will fulfill all of our obligations. Let's put the grain deal back on the table. No, they go, they go around, try to get the, the Turks to uh, put pressure on them. They, they try to convince the nations of the global south to put pressure on Russia diplomatically. Anything, anything but to deal in good faith. Every underhanded tactic comes first. So, you know, same thing with the other colonies. They will, they will try everything before they ever come to thinking about dealing with other nations um, as equals and in good faith. With the military bases, because I know, well, I mean, I'm told by checking there's 29 American military bases, but I've heard more, but that's the search. There's probably other European ones. They're not really needed in Africa. Like, I mean, eventually I can see them kind of moving on. I mean, what, what's the purpose of having all the military bases all over Africa? Uh, the purpose of having military bases is to enforce freedom and democracy. You know, that's, that, that's it. Because if somebody, if somebody wants to not be colonized anymore, if somebody wants to renegotiate their contracts and their loans with the Western financial institutions and the Western corporations, then, you know, there's, that, there's the military there uh, to, uh, to regime change them and to make sure that whoever is in power is, uh, you know, amenable to Western interests. Meaning, you know, like I, I, I still don't don't know whether this is a true fact, but apparently, uh, France was purchasing uranium from Niger, uranium ore, the the, the uranium yellow cake, at something like twenty percent of the market price in the world. And uh, you know, this is this is typical. And of course, this is wonderfully lucrative for, for the French industrialists and for French bankers. It's not so good for uh, Niger. And so, you know, if somebody in Niger says enough, we're going to get our correct price. This is our, uh, these, are, these are our resources. We will sell them at a fair price. Well, then that's why you have the, the, the military there so that they can enforce freedom and democracy which is you know uh, how we exploit the colonies today yeah, excellent no it's it, it really it, it, the strategy that the western hegemony um, has been using is i guess it's getting it's expiring or has expired as as alex mentioned so then what's happening now with the BRICS? and the addition of what's at five countries. Could you talk more about that? Like, it's just interesting that what I know is that they also have the new development bank. So in my mind, what is the relationship of the new development bank to are they free from the bank of international settlements? Or do they have a working relationship, maybe, right, with the World Bank? And I'm, I'm bringing this up to you about the BRICS because there's also a uh, comment and a question from the viewer saying that do they really think that the BRICS countries can coexist? Now, what they, who they refers to, I would assume that that refers to the member countries itself of the BRICS. And, and it says it's all about who has control and the Illuminati still want control of the population. So what, how is strategic is a BRICS club or organizations doing that they first chose the first, the new addition of what five countries? Because I think it's very strategic the way they chose it. And then, yeah, tell, tell us about, because it's all about the money too, right? So how powerful will the BRICS be in terms of follow the money? 
Uh, well, yes, you're right, Grace. It is. It it, it it does appear to have been strategic. You know, they have uh, they have accepted the the six new nations that together with them, I think they control something like seventy percent of the global uh, energy supplies, and energy is absolutely essential. Uh, I, I think that it's early days, and I think that the BRICS uh, movement will grow. Um, I think it's a real challenge to the Western centers of power, a real one. And I think that it's extraordinarily attractive to all the, you know, commodity exporting nations in the world, because while the Western powers had monopoly on, you know, on trade, on financial flows and, um, you know, also had military dominance, there wasn't a choice. So you had to, you kind of had to make do with what was offered. And since there was no choice, also the political leadership in all those nations kind of had to, uh, you know, if they wanted to be in power, they had to make nice with the Western centers of power, with Washington, with London, with Paris and so forth. And no, this is, this is no longer the case. Now, you know, there's always a, people always um, have misgivings if they see that the new development bank maybe has a relationship with Bank of International Settlements. Now, I don't know whether that's the case. I don't know if, if this bank is a member of the Bank of, uh, you know, uh, of the Bank of International Settlements. I would, I would have to look at that. That's an interesting question. But, you know, they will have relationship with the IMF, with the World Bank. You, you know, you will still have financial flows between these two systems. I very much doubt that it's anybody's intention really to, cre to create two mutually exclusive blocks and then to uh, erect an iron curtain between them and, and you know, you know, the kind of like the North Korea type of situation where you, where you have like a, a, a citadel bricks that doesn't want to have anything to do with the rest of the world because it's evil. I think that you want to keep the cooperation alive and you want to uh, deal with them in a way by coercing them and pressuring them into... Uh, dealing with good faith. There will be, you know, uh, a lot of nations have their gold reserves stored in New York or London. And they also have debts towards um, Western financial institutions. So at some point, many of them will probably want their gold repatriated. And, you know, uh, there's a good chance that they will find out that their gold is gone, that, you know, the West cannot give them their gold back. This happened to Germany, to Austria, to, you know, they, the, the gold thing will be, will be a mess. And at that point, these countries will be able to say like, okay, uh, if we cannot have our gold back, then we will default on, on all these loans. We'll not pay back anymore. Um, these, the, all these things will be working themselves over a long period of time. And, uh, I think that even politically, they will be difficult to manage. And I think that, you know, uh, some years ago, uh, researchers in India worked out that during during a British colonial period, that they extracted something like forty four trillion dollars worth of value from from India. I would not be surprised if India doesn't uh, pursue this. You know, demand some form of uh, um, reparations from Britain, and you know not not necessarily just from the sovereign government, but maybe even try to trace their, their stolen wealth to, their, to the um, 
uh, ultimate beneficiaries. To do that, you need to use British judicial system. You know, you need to bring uh, law, lawsuits in, in British courts. You need to depose uh, witnesses there. You need to uh, get into the archives and, and so forth. So I think that there are many, many good reasons to keep the bridges intact, to, to keep the channels of communication and cooperation open. And so um, people shouldn't make too much out of the, you know, if it emerges that, you know, the new development bank has a relationship with the BIS, there's, there's probably good reasons for that and IMF and the World Bank and, and, and all these other structures because, you know, we, this is not going to be a conflict between the, the BRICS nations and the Western nations as, 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 a, as a collection of monoliths this is going to be the purging of humanity from the, the system of governance that has victimized both the, you know, the, 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 the colonized nations and the, the domestic populations in the United States, in Britain, in France, uh, Spain, you, you know, whatever you have there. And so I, I it's, it seems to me that the leadership of these nations, China, India, Russia, um, and so forth, are, are very sophisticated. I think that they know where they're going with this. It's going to be a very long process, but I think that um, they will pursue it uh, to, to, to some logical end. I think at the very minimum, there's going to be a very high-profile Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commissions. But I think beyond that, uh, there's going to be uh, legal pursuits of stolen wealth. And I think that the West has to brace for that. Well, you know, the West, the, these, all these uh, banking cartels and all, all these uh, families that control them. I do look forward to that day and it's exciting that we are witnessing everything that's happening now. So, you know, our, my lifetime, I think is very exciting and it's good if we can still, you know, um, have that benefit. And when, uh, and Alice, when you were talking about um, also like reparations and all that, I still remember just a little anecdote on my side when, when my friends knew that I was coming to America in 1980s and said, why are you going to the mouth of the, we consider it as the mouth of the enemy, the stomach of the enemy, because of the Western hegemony that we were aware of. So I said, I'm going there to claim what's partly mine. <laughs> so that's what I said, so it's partly mine. So I'm going there and see what I can do for myself. So, um, and when, when Roy made a comment about the CBDC and all that, uh, it, it brought to my mind the, the word de-dollarization because it seems like most people are also apprehensive about the West not, well, you know, to those who think that it's only the West that controls the economy, what's going to happen with their dollars. And many of the parents are don't know what to do. So I guess the question is, how fast those people who have dollars have to make some changes? Do they have to get rid of dollars? Because in my in my understanding, no, we 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 we're, the dollar is not going to disappear; it still be useful. So educate us with that. Well, you know, I uh, making predictions is is a very thankless uh, task. You know, I I I, I couldn't predict that, but. I think that in all likelihood, you are right. People should not panic. You know, they should, they should think things through. They should make their contingency plans. They should, uh, you know, diversify themselves into, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still agnostic about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. You know, maybe it's a good thing or I don't know. Uh, but, you know, you want to have a little bit of... Um, little bit of land you want to have a little bit of uh, gold and silver bullion probably you want to have some dollars in cash probably um you want to uh, you know uh downsize appropriately because you know the crisis is coming but you know the idea that you have to 
rush out and get rid of all your dollars and and just buy whatever with it uh i think it doesn't it doesn't usually happen that way you know there, there has been there has been examples in the past where things unravel very very quickly you know uh like the weimar republic uh 100 years ago in germany um and the soviet union you know soviet union had practically inflation go from nothing to 500 percent overnight practically uh, so these things do happen but i don't think that it's going to be like that with the us dollar because the the you know the american central bank has does have sovereignty they are protective of the dollar at, at a huge expense uh to to the economy and uh, they do have a lot of maneuvering space because the dollar is still uh the main trading currency in the world and the main reserve currency in the world you know the, 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 this position is is uh, is in the in decline and it will continue to decline but it's not going to be overnight you know so i think that the and and also you know we have to know that the united states has tremendous economic potential you know the, the united states still has a very strong diversified economy a uh, great entrepreneurial spirit you know if if credit is allocated to the right places in the right ways uh, the economy will spring back into 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 health it could be a matter of you know uh the, the democratic party being voted voted out and somebody like trump coming back into the white house that could that could change things dramatically so i i would not I would not quite be panicked about the US dollar. I'm I'm a lot more panicked about the euro and the and the British pound and the yen. I think that there things are going to be a lot uglier, a lot faster. But again, you know, impossible to predict. We'll just have to live and find out. With the the BRICS and like if we look at the population of like say China and India, Pakistan is a massive country that's going to next to them. Where do they stand in all of this? Um, I think that there's a growing political um, groundswell of opinion and awareness that is moving in favor of the BRICS movement. I think this is I think this is broad based. The you know the the people who understand what's going on are probably most of them in favor of this. Um, this is why, uh, you know, we had a coup in, in Pakistan recently. But I think that this coup is, is actually quite fragile. You know, they, they just tried to do away with... Um, Okay, so now I blanked out on the name of the of the popular former prime minister of Pakistan. Please help me out. Okay. Grace is checking it. <laughs> yeah, please. I, this is this is horribly embarrassing because the name should be a household name, you know. Uh, Anyway, you know the former cricket player. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually can visualize him as well. I'm after forgetting yeah. myself. To be honest, this is too weird. I. Anyway, uh, so um, he's very popular still, and you know to make sure that he he can't become prime minister anymore, they tried to put him in jail. It have except they have no valid grounds for putting him in jail. So they tried to change laws to give themselves valid grounds to put him in jail. Uh, something to do with the... Uh, with, uh, Is that know, uh, Imran Khan? Imran Khan, thank you. I was, you know, I was, I was going to say Sadiq Khan, but I knew that Sadiq Khan <laughs> was a different person. <laughs> I know, you better not say, uh, say it wrong. You know. <laughs> yes, and especially since Sadiq Khan is, uh, is, uh, is the, the wrong name to bring into the discussion. The, the mayor of London, the little evil gnome. Um, 
so uh, Imran, to they they try to pass a law in in Pakistan uh, that would make make it a five year uh, an offense punishable by five years in prison for um, leaking information that is of concern to national security and uh, and then you know they pretended like they passed the law but the current prime minister uh, swore to god that he never signed this law so they 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 fake passed it they pretended that they have passed it to try to finagle uh, a case against imran khan it all fell apart now i i, I don't know what happens from here on now but you know, on the one hand, you have a groundswell of public opinion that wants to move the nation uh, in favor of, uh, you know, uh, multilateral integrations into one belt, one road uh, 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 integrations uh, and Eurasian uh, economic integrations with Russia and with Iran and India and, and, and China. And on the other hand, you have these very improbable, very fragile schemes run by the deep state to try to orchestrate a coup, to bring in somebody completely unpopular in power, to try to imprison the leader that everybody in the country, or nearly everybody in the country wants to see uh, as their leader. And so, uh, you know, you have you have the clash between something that's very robust and whose time is coming versus something that's very fragile and that it's, it's, it's in its dying throes. And I think that, you know, this is, this is actually happening in the United States as well, which is why, you know, the democratic national Congress and the, the department of justice and the FBI in the United States are desperate to find some kind of a way to, uh, to put away Donald Trump, to make sure that he cannot, uh, run the country uh, after 2024. So I, I think this is pretty much going on everywhere. And we see that, you know, these, um, these empire builders, the people who are working in favor of the empire are, are really standing on glass legs while the, 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 the large, there's, there's a large, broad-based groundswell of political movement that is that is going away from them that is and, and they're losing control over it and i think that all these schemes that they're trying to to pull uh, to reverse this is is pretty much like king canute flogging the waves to to try to stem the tide this is this is i think exactly where we're at and like you mentioned, uh, you know, the mayor of uh, London and, you know, they're trying to put up all these surveillance cameras and have the 15 million cities. But what is beautiful to see is the Blade Runner group, which are going around, cutting them down it's and fantastic. it's just growing and it's just showing, hey, we can win this. And I'm hoping yes. that they'll do the same with like the 5G and everything. You know, it's like once they realize Absolutely. that this is Absolutely. so dangerous, it yes. shows power is in in the locals. Yes, exactly. And this is, I, I thank you for bringing this up. I think this is extremely important. And I, I, I think I mentioned earlier in this podcast that it is, it is extremely important for them to have our cooperation and compliance. And you can see this with the Blade Runner group. Well, you know, maybe they'll try to find a way to stop the Blade Runner group, but there's going to be some other group that are, go, that are going to do the same. And, you know, people can be extremely ingenious when they, when they set their minds to doing something. And I, you know, I, Okay, so I, I'm going to put this in one of the my um, next substacks, but I wanted to, you know, I I actually watched the new normal in in the south of France die in front of my eyes, and it's exactly because of, for the lack of compliance. So here's what happened: it was May, it was late May of 2020, and you know the beaches have been closed uh, all year and, and until then, and. Uh, and then I think on 20th May or something like that, they opened the beaches, but they created this new system. You can just go to the beach and have your day in the sun. They created this iron uh, fencing where, you know, they, they, they blocked off 
like a like a 20 or 30 meter um you know 100 foot section of the beach they created a corridor where people could all go down to the beach they would have a maximum of one hour to be in the water and then you had to walk along the beach to the other corridor where you come back and then you go to the designated area where you change and then off you go that's your day at the beach and there was uh, something like nine or ten police there uh, in full riot gear and one of them with an automatic gun with his finger on the on the trigger the whole time and so okay i refuse to participate in this because you know i think that if you do participate you're 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 kind of implicitly accepting the new order um and the first so what i did is i i, I brought my kids out because there was no school remember and you know they were desperate to be out to play and so forth so I, I just brought them to a grass area that was just next to this new uh, new normal beach facility. And so for the next four days, I spent hours there, you know, letting my kids play and me just observing all this. And, you know, the day, day one, the police were, you know, quite diligent. They were, you know, with their whistles, uh, warning People, you can't do that, you can't do that, you, you must not go there, you must go here, uh, and barking their orders at the people. And the second day, you know, they were visibly less interested in doing that. You know, the, like a, the cop would like yell at somebody and then if this people, if this person didn't hear them or didn't react, they would just go like, oh, you know, can't be bothered with this. Day four, it was the old normal. You know, uh, people just went all over the beach, lay down their towels, and the police were just completely powerless and helpless. Not only that, they were not even interested in it. They were not going to chase people around the beach to, to bring them into the, you know, cattle facility for, for, for beach going. And so, you know, it was it was a very obvious example of the way you know these um, these enforcement schemes. You know the the police and 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 other kind of state enforcement uh, ca capacities are very easily overwhelmed by people who do not comply. Their their ability to enforce the rule is very limited, and so uh, this will be the case with the fifteen minute cities, I believe. This was the case with this new normal uh, beach going that we saw in France. And this is this is why I think we can be very optimistic that nothing that they have uh, stacked up against us will work unless we surrender, acquiesce and comply with them. All we have to do is not comply and it's not going to happen. And like, I think just from me going deep down the rabbit hole of kind of common law, sovereignty, UCC, I see loads of people are going down that route. And for example, in that situation, and if the police officer says it's trying to get you to do something, you say, who's the injured party? For a crime to be committed, there has to be somebody that's injured. And if yes. they say mandate, when you understand it, you can go to Black Law's dictionary and say, show me the contract. Where have I signed that? And once you start understanding the law and that you can start, you know, be sovereign and say, hey, this doesn't apply to me because I've used it here, even with masks and stuff like that, they back off. And even with judges and everything. And most people, they think you have to be afraid of these because they're they're in power. The reality is they're supposed to serve us. And there's more yes. and more people realizing that. And that's how we're going to make a big shift. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Uh, yes, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and, uh, you know, all these little acts of defiance uh, and resistance are, you know, creating friction for their system. And, you know, if, you know, you do that, it may seem insignificant, but if you multiply that friction by a million or a hundred million, that that just stops the grind that grinds the whole juggernaut to a halt. And they, you know, actually, you know, their their whole pandemic scheme failed miserably. It completely failed. You know, remember in the beginning, there were all these pronouncements that old normal is gone, never to come back. Uh, 
you know, to think that we're going to the old normal is, a, is, is an illusion. It's never going to happen and so forth. Well, we pretty much are in the old normal now again. And, you know, they'll, they'll try again, but, you know. But it looks like, because just from things I'm seeing that they're going to try it again, they're talking about, like we've heard information, whether it's, you know, a fake news that they're kind of just feeding us, because it's very hard to know who we can trust in this. There's a lot of, uh, you know, controlled oppositions. But, you know, there's people in hospitals, they're saying the masks, again. I've heard in two hospitals in America, one university, they're bringing the masks, they're going to be doing all this again. And, but... The amount of people that kind of said no way so they have you know it lasted so long last time but if they do try it i don't think it's gonna they'll get anywhere I, near where it was i think it's extremely unlikely i agree with you because you know it didn't work the first time and the first time a lot of people actually bought the emergency you know they thought that there was a real pandemic and that you know we do need to you know play by the rules and obey for the common good and so forth. So there was, a, you know, like they, they squandered a lot of credit with the ordinary people. And that credit has been squandered. So now if they try to run the same thing again, I, I think its shelf life is going to be so much shorter than the first time around. Um, if they try it, I think it's going. it's just going to be an indication of how absolutely desperate they are because they're losing control all across the board and so to 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 try a scheme that you failed at just three years ago and everybody saw you fail and nothing worked correctly you know the the whole pandemic agenda was incoherent uh in every respect and then they roll out the vaccines, and I think that today it's clear to most people that these, you know, whatever this shot was, it wasn't a vaccine, and it wasn't effective, and it wasn't safe. And so to try to do all that again, while the last failure is vivid in everybody's living memory, is just profound desperation. I mean, you, you almost feel embarrassed for them. Excellent. There's a quick question here, Alex, in relation to what you the end of the Western colonialism in relation to the World Health Organization. So that would mean that there will be the UN, the World Health Organization. We could see, hopefully, good changes, okay? Because now, we especially that as, it, as Roy brought it up, that all this harsh news about, okay, the, we got a lockdown again or something. What's your thought on that, in the effect on that United Nations and the World Health Organization? Um, I think that there is a chance that it will be reformed in some positive way, but I'm not very optimistic. You know, they have, they have already uh, shredded their own credibility. I, I don't know. You might remember that. I don't even remember when exactly this was, but I do remember... Uh, um, the guy, the, the World Health Organization Secretary General, what is his name? Uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, something like this, right? You do remember him solemnly pronouncing that the monkeypox pandemic is, the monkeypox breakout was a pandemic of international concern. I think it, something like that, the wording. So he was practically declaring a pandemic again. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. And, you know, I know that a number of these strange initiatives have been in the works through the same, through the same, uh, through the same hierarchy of command and control. And, and nothing happened, you know. I, I I think that maybe about a year ago, still in Germany, they were trying to introduce mask wearing ob as as a permanent thing between I think October and March. They were saying like, oh, you know, it's the season of flus. We should always wear, wear masks on a permanent basis. Well, that failed. Last July in France, they wanted to extend the, um, you know, the QR vaccine pass codes, you know, because back during the pandemic when they brought out the vaccines, 
you got a certificate, you got a QR code, and without the QR code, you couldn't go to a restaurant, you couldn't go to a train, you couldn't, you know, there's all, 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 all sorts of things that you couldn't do. And uh, they tried to extend it last July, and it failed in French Parliament. It was voted down. So, you know, now everybody had their had the World Health Organization and the, and the absolutely massive conflicts of interest there in, in, in the spotlight for, for many months. They've lost authority. Um, everybody understands that it's a, it's, a, it's a fraud. The whole thing is a fraud and, and not a benevolent one by a long shot. And so, you know, it, 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 might, it might remain one of those, um, how do you call it, uh, global administrative agencies that will not serve any useful purpose anymore. I think that, well, okay, so this is why I'm saying I'm not optimistic about any kind of a positive reform. I think that the, the whole subject of healthcare will have to be, you know, as they say, as they say, the world, you know, the World Economic Forum people say it'll have to be uh, reimagined and rethought and retooled, but from the ground up. Because, you know, we have a, we have a great deal of knowledge um, about ailments and remedies and, and, you know, what makes good health and what makes bad health and so forth. But it's not being used in a very effective way. It, you know, like everything is everything is predicated on um, pharmaceuticals or surgical interventions. And so I think that there are many, many people out there with great idea, with extensive knowledge, with the ability to help uh, to, to 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 help people uh, be better and cure themselves. But you know, they're not they're not being given uh, the resources and the way to reach to people so that people know where they can seek help, effective help. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, in many of these treatments, there isn't, there isn't a great deal of money. There's no way to leverage one molecule, you know, register intellectual property over it and then make sure that everybody in the whole world forever pays your royalties. This is just, you know, you help somebody, they pay your fee, and that's done. That's a lot of work if you're going to make a living like that. But I think that this is this is how health healthcare um, should be organized. It shouldn't be a big profit center for for the economy. And I think that that will have to be rethought from the ground up. I think this is the perfect way of ending unless uh, Roy have something more, because, you know, it's all about knowing what we have in ourselves, in our culture, yes. in our family, and yeah, health, because, you know, if we are healthy, we can do many things for our, the people and for our community. So, and then we won't be scared, because I think that's what happened. We're so scared because we forgot all about what we can do. So Yes, precisely. Yeah. Precisely. You know, we have a saying in Croatian. We have a saying that a healthy person has a thousand wishes. The, uh, a person who's ill only has one. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. It's very true. Very true. It's very empowering. So, uh, Alex, invite people who are to get in touch with you. Well, I am I'm very easy to find on on Twitter or X. Uh, my handle is at Naked Hedgy, and then I have a I have a Substack, which is uh, uh, you know I I have Alex Craner. Alex Craner dot Substack dot com. Everything's free. I I don't uh, um, I don't publish anything behind a paywall. So you know people are people are more than welcome to subscribe. Thank you. And uh, uh, do uh, follow Roy and me. Roy has that uh, awakening. That's just one of his other podcasts, but for all these critical conversations. So, and um, I welcome also your suggestions, the audience suggestions on who, what topics, who do you want to invite. And you fo follow me as well 
okay? And uh, sometimes we get a break because we need to really have a good break for ourselves so we don't follow a rigid yes. schedule. Yes. And like next week, I, I will be uh, do, going attending the event of very critical uh, thinker doctors and ahead of our time also. So, all right. So as uh, Alex said, we we need to really take care of ourselves in a way that the divine uh, healing is really given to us, divine medicine, eternal, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So thank you. I'm, I'm just uh, on that as well, Grace, just to let you know. So on my own show, because I'm big into the Saturday, I'm getting BB back is back. I'm getting Peter Stone and Peter Wilson, and they all delve into that. They all have their own ways of doing it, but they're ones just to watch. They're, they're in the, the next week, I'll have all of them. Yeah, yeah, and we'd, we'd have them with us also. So, Alex, come back again. Take care of yourselves. And, hey, you've been traveling, so if you know you end up in the United States, in the East Coast, in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia area, that's where I am, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, always good to join you. And uh, I will absolutely be delighted to join you again in the future. And if I am uh, in New York or New Jersey in the near future, I'll, I'll, I'll keep in mind to say hello. Take care, everyone. And yeah, the, the best thing you can do is subscribe, like, share and donate when you can, Alex also, and to, to all our guests, because most of us are, are really just doing this because we needed to, we feel the need that we are doing something truly purposeful and meaningful in our day-to-day -day life. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. You'll find everything about me on bio.link forward slash podcaster with all my podcasts and you find it you see in the qr code in the graphic that's shown i'd like again to thank my sponsors so if you or someone you know struggling with anxiety and want to know how to be 100 percent anxiety free six weeks without therapy or drugs daniel packard's anxiety solution program company offers a six-week system that permanently solves anxiety at an astounding 90 percent success rate people who join the program only pay at the end once they have clear measurable results if you're interested in learning more, go to permanentanxietysolutions.com where you can book a free consultation with Daniel. Do you fight blood pressure and or want to get off the meds? Doctors are amazed at what Zona Plus can do. You can get a $50 discount with my code Roy, zona.com slash discount slash Roy. And you'll see it in the QR code as well as Daniel's QR code. Quality manufacturer, of metal products for telecommunication and workshop equipment and other metal materials. You see the brochure there in the QR code and let me know if you would like a quotation shipped internationally at very competitive price. I'd like to thank all my sponsors and also all my listeners. Be sure to give me a thumbs up, five star rating, share with your friends, really helps. And I also have a video on how to give a five star rating because a lot of people have wrote to me asking me that they don't know how to do that. Until next week, take care.